This lecture was made possible by a gift from the late James and Mavis Wilson. This series is meant to bring to campus scholars who engage the Trinity and broader San Antonio community in conversations about the role that faith and spiritual exploration can play in forming and empowering deeper understanding of ourselves, our communities, and the world. Introducing our speaker this evening is Dr. Chad Spiegel, professor of religion, where he teaches courses in the Hebrew Bible, Judaism, and archaeology. He's also the former director of our Mellon Initiative for Undergraduate Research and the current chair of our faculty senate. Thank you, Dr. Spiegel. Thank you. So I first met our speaker 20 years ago when we were both graduate students at Duke University. I distinctly remember having a very long conversation with her at a party and being in complete awe of the soon-to-be Dr. Gaffney. It's not just that she knew a lot about the Hebrew Bible, Judaism, and Christianity, which she did. I was also in awe of the impressive and, at least to me, unexpected things she had accomplished before working on her PhD, including serving as a chaplain in the Army. Little did I know, although based on our conversation I, would, I am not surprised, that almost two decades later, I would stumble upon her book, Womanist Midrash, and find a brilliant work of scholarship and the perfect addition to the Hebrew Bible course I teach here at Trinity University. A few years ago, I started teaching Womanist Midrash in an effort to introduce students to diverse ways the biblical texts can be interpreted by different people in different times, living in different places, and coming from different perspectives. There are many things that I love about Womanist Midrash, but I'll limit myself to mentioning two. First, I love how Dr. Gaffney invites everyone to the supper table to discuss the biblical texts and that Jewish, Christian, and Muslim perspectives all contribute to Dr. Gaffney's womanist readings. Second, I love that this is a book written for those who read the Bible as a religious text, but Dr. Gaffney does so as a classically trained biblical scholar, utilizing many of the traditional tools of biblical scholarship and employing them as a womanist. There is a lot that religious readers can learn from this book, but there's also a lot traditional biblical scholars can learn as well. Based on my students' reaction to these past, couple, these past couple of years, I am certain they share my enthusiasm for Reverend Dr. Gaffney's teachings. It should be no surprise then that I am thrilled to introduce womanist biblical scholar, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney to Trinity University. Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney is the Rev Right Reverend Sam B. Holsey Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth. In addition to being the author of Womanist Midrash, she is also the author of A Woman's Lectionary for the Whole Church, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, and Daughters of Miriam, Women Prophets in Ancient Israel. She has recently completed a second volume of Womanist Midrash focusing on women in the prophets, which is coming out shortly. In addition to her position at Bright, uh, Reverend Dr. Gaffney is an Episcopal priest, ca canonically resident in the Diocese of Pennsylvania, and licensed in the Diocese of Texas. And she's a former member of the Dorche Derech Reconstructionist Minion of the Germantown Jewish Center in Philadelphia, and has co-taught courses with and for the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Seminary. And if that is not enough, Dr. Gaffney is also an amateur watercolorist and an activist. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. Thank you, Chad, and it's a delight to find you here. Uh, a Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church is a four-volume work, uh, three standard years and one standalone volume. The first two volumes, years A and W, that standalone volume, taking W uh, for its focus on women, were published together. I call them the root beer pack, A and W. Uh, B is now finished, and I am at Lent 1 in year C, so this whole thing may be over in my lifetime. Lent is a hungry time, yet the scriptures and traditions of Judaism and Christianity are full of food and feasting. The psalmist bids us taste and see. Wisdom has set her table. The gospel is food for hungry souls and the Eucharistic altar is its table. 
but in conversations with others around various tables. Some of us have found in the course of our years-long consumption of scriptural fare that we were going hungry, hungry for stories about people like us, hungry for stories about girls like us, women like us, non-binary folk like us. I began to quench my own hunger and thirst with recipes I learned in divinity school and later graduate school. Careful, close reading of the biblical text, primarily in Hebrew, either at synagogue or on digital recordings in the practice of listening to the text to help me with my reading. From the earliest days of my seminary formation, apparently in a previous century, I was focused on women prophets, a topic that would see me into and through a PhD program and the publishing of my very first book, Daughters of Miriam, and then a conversation with my doctoral advisor lit the fires of my sanctified imagination. Now, for those of you who are not as lovingly kissed by the sun with melanin as I am, sanctified imagination may on its surface make sense as holy imaginings. But in the black church, the sanctified imagination is a practice of preaching that is its own way midrash, its own way of storytelling. It's a space in which a pastor or a preacher from anywhere on the con continuum from burn it all down, progressive, to let's pretend we're living in the first century conservative. All of them can engage in this practice which is launched by saying, in my sanctified imagination. And then the pastor or priest or preacher tells a story about the text that's not in the text. And because it's been framed with, in my sanctified imagination, the congregation knows a story is coming. And they also give the pastor, priest, or preacher permission to go beyond the bounds of the text, which is important in those places where people say, show it to me in the word, doc. Right? So, in my sanctified imagination as a black preacher already in development, when I had this conversation with my advisor, who was working on a dictionary of all the women in all the canons of scripture, she uncovered these tidbits that got me going. There are fill in the blank names of women in the Hebrew Bible. I always give quizzes. Pick a number. What do you think? How many women have a name preserved in the Hebrew Bible? You said 3,000? Very generous of you. Okay, <laughs> we'll, be do, we'll be puppeteering. 1,426. I'm sorry, that's, I've already thrown you off. I have completely thrown you off. There are 1,426 names of people, humans in the Hebrew Bible. Now, let's go back and get the women's names now that I've given you the right framework. I heard, <laughs> I, I'm in Texas, I heard 20, do I hear 200? I'm about to sell you a head of cattle. Four, come on, Bishop. 60, 111 or as I like to say as somebody who is very fond of L-O-T-R, Lord of the Rings, 111 D. So there's 111 D, but perhaps most folk don't know more than four, right? 9%, roughly 9% of those names in the Hebrew Bible. When you look at the entirety of women's names in all three canons of scriptures, 205, but of that 205, 70% of them are in the Hebrew Bible. So if you want to work with female characters who have their names preserved, that's the space. 
And talking to my advisor, she let drop this story that there was a gentleman who was on the cleaning staff who taught Sunday school in his church. And so he would ask all the professors at Duke for information. So he probably had the best run lay Sunday school class going in North Carolina. And he said, everybody knows Mary is the most common woman's name in the New Testament. What's the most common woman's name in the Hebrew Bible? And Carol Myers had absolutely no idea. But this project got her there. And the answer was a surprise to everybody. Do you know, Chad? Because I talk about it in the book. Ma'aka. And everybody says, say what now? <laughs> M double A C A H. Ma'aka. There are more Ma'akot, women named Ma'aka in the Hebrew Bible, than there are women named Mary. So leave that out there for somebody looking for a paper topic. So I decided that I would write and teach and preach about these women, and that's where Womanist Midrash came from, offering readers and hearers a reintroduction to scriptures they may have thought they knew through characters they may not have known, along with an emphasis on translation and what it, what it reveals about the text beneath the text that we may not know if we access it in English or another language of translation. So all through this process, I'm sitting in churches, listening to scripture readings, retranslating them in my head or in my mouth when I'm reading and reciting and preaching. And I didn't know it was odd or that other people didn't do this, but I've been preparing my own translations from which to preach from the moment I learned enough Hebrew and Greek to do so, oh, I should say, and taught myself enough Greek, because apparently it was a scandal at Duke that I taught myself Greek and didn't take Greek, which nobody would have ever known if they hadn't asked me. And then they put me in remedial Greek, which, in which I just read the Bible in Latin because I was mad and I refused to do it. All right. So one day, 16 October 2017, I had enough of being hungry and thirsty. I was looking at preaching texts for some sermon somewhere, and I hated everything that was up in the lectionary. And so I did what we tend to do in this generation. I got on Facebook and whined about it. Then I got on Twitter and whined about it some more. And I said, what would it look like if women built a lectionary focusing on women's stories? And then, all these people jumped in my mentions and said, Dr. Gampney, why don't you do it? I was like, well, I do have a sabbatical coming up. And thus, a women's lectionary for the whole church was born. Is there anyone here who is not familiar with the lectionary tradition? Because I've used the word a couple of times now. Thank you. So a lectionary is a preaching calendar. It has all the texts that are preached on Sundays and days of religious observance. Uh, I'm speaking particularly of Christian tradition. There's a similar system in Judaism. The word lectionary, though, is a Christian word. And in the Christian churches that use lectionaries from Orthodox Christianity to Roman Catholicism to all of the other Catholicisms, which is a whole other course, to uh, the Anglican Communion, including my tradition, the Episcopal Church, to Methodists, to a lot, if not most, Presbyterians, to some American Baptists and a whole bunch of other folk, the majority of Christians on the planet experience scripture through a lectionary in which the passages for each Sunday are pre-selected. And there are major lectionaries. So orthodoxy, I'm putting them all in one bucket. There's some subdivisions there, but they tend to follow lectionary. Roman Catholics have the Missal system, and then the RCL, the Revised Common Lectionary, gets all the Protestants and the Episcopalians, who I don't quite see as Protestants, in one bucket. But the lectionary did not represent women well numerically, not in any of them. 
because I was making an argument that if there's 111 women in the Hebrew Bible, there is no reason you can't have a woman every Sunday of the year. There's only 52 of those Sundays. And that's just the Hebrew Bible. That doesn't include the deuterocanonical works in the New Testament. Surely we could do better. So I tried to do better. Now, that's named women. We did not even account for the women you count, encounter most often, wife of, mother, mother of, daughter of, sister of. So there are all of these characters that when reading the text religiously, one might ask, what is it we are to learn through this person and their story? The text has been distilled for those of us who read in Christianity and Judaism as to who the heroes are and what the big moves are. Often it's the people who have all the speaking parts, the people who talk to God, to whom God talks, and most often those are male people. But it's equally clear that the stories of liberation and triumph and also decimation and devastation are not gendered stories, they are human stories. So I sought to create a lectionary, and I have now created a lectionary, starting with the Hebrew Bible, because it's important for me as a person who primarily teaches Christians that Christians have an understanding of the Hebrew Bible as a full and sufficient canon of scripture through which God is revealed and communicated. That the Hebrew Bible is not the Jesus predicting magic eight ball that much of Christian tradition has made it out to be. There's a full and sufficient canon of scripture. So even though a lectionary is a Christian construct and it's going to be navigable by the contours of the Christian year, the seasons, when we say Christmas is, when we say Easter is, when we say all of these other religious feasts are, and those events uh, have within them ideas about how to tell their story. So even though that's going to be a major driving force, I said, let me start at the other end. So for example, when in the Advent season, the story of the Annunciation is featured, even though that's completely wrong time of year because the Annunciation is in March, if we're saying Christmas is in December, but we just bring it back like people forgot about it. That's just something that happens. So go in with it because you inherit a lot of traditions. I said, well, there's an Annunciation to Hagar. There's an Annunciation to Sarah. There's an Annunciation to Hannah. There's an Annunciation to Samson's mother. Oh, we have four Annunciation texts for the four weeks of Advent. So we're studying this event that happens in the New Testament that people might think of in isolation, but we're studying it in such a way as to say, this is the thing that God does and has done a lot and did before the New Testament so that what happens in the New Testament culturally and religiously, even though there's going to be a break, is being read and constructed in continuity with what happens in the Hebrew Bible. We're going to look at one of those sets of readings later. So I decided to look for texts uh, that feature women to weave together in the structure we have, which is a first reading that is from the Hebrew Bible, except in one particular season when we study the growth of the church after Pentecost, it can be the book of Acts. But a first lesson primarily from the Hebrew Bible, followed by the psalm, a psalm or some other piece of poetry, sometimes a, a canticle or a song of the church that's woven together from scripture. Then kind of anything in the New Testament except the gospel, because then the gospel gets its own spot. So I want you to think about this. Four lessons a Sunday, 52 Sundays a year, seven principal feasts of the church, which get their own readings, full week of readings for 
Holy Week and full week of readings for Easter. I chose the same because you know Christmas we kind of got to do the manger story right like so the resurrection story happens in Easter but other than that complete freedom and I translated all of those texts from Hebrew Greek and Aramaic I, that really wasn't my initial plan I thought I could massage the NRSV but no so I now, a Hebrew Bible scholar, have apparently translated the entire Gospel of Mark because it's so short and I had to stretch it, which was never a life goal. But here we are. So I looked for connecting themes and language across the Psalms and New Testament readings, and I took into account patterns like preaching through the life of David through the summer. We have this long period of time where we can sort of follow a story over a number of weeks. But I did it centering the women, which means, um, if you've ever read anything I've written, it, how I think and feel about David won't come as a surprise, but the rest of you, it's good you're sitting down. So going through David, I center on his violent re relationships with women from, from rape to slaughter. And similarly, for the great vigil of Easter, we tell the stories of scripture, like really fast, right? But when the Great Vigil is introduced in the Book of Common Prayer in the Episcopal Church, there's a line that says something like, let us tell stories of the faithfulness of God. And then we have all these scripture readings. So God is not only faithful to men and through men. So I threw all those stories in, well, maybe not the dirt, but on the other side of my desk. And I said, well, we could do Deborah, and we could do Judith, and we could do... Jehosheba, and so the great vigil in my lectionary tells the story of the faithfulness of God, but not through David or Samson or Joshua or any of those guys, because there's a lectionary for them. I mentioned that translation is a critical aspect of the lectionary and of all my work. I write on translation at some length in the appendix in Womanist Midrash, which I certainly commend to you. And I have a uh, more abridged discussion of translation as it pertains to the lectionary, which I hope we'll get to. Now, unlike male stream biblical interpretation, I explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. So you will not encounter words on a page saying, behold, the word of the Lord, and have no idea who's doing what and why and what's happening behind the scene. I'm going to put it all out for you. So the translation style that I'm using in the women's lectionary is one I developed in Daughters of Miriam, which is my study of prophets in ancient Israel in the wider Afro-Asiatic world. And it's gender expansive. And what that means is that when there are collections of people like the Israelites, we'll take an expression like B'nai Yisrael, which most literally means two things. It means sons of Israel. So a text could say, B'nai Yisrael Abraham, the sons of Abraham were, and give you a list. But it also means the children of Abraham are, and maybe you get a different list. Now, here's how that math maths. All sons are children. All children are not sons. Children of Israel is always going to be right. right? And so then we get a text, well, the B'nai Israel left Egypt in a really fancy way. They did not leave B'nai Israel, the daughters of Israel, behind. So when you're talking about people groups, translations have moved from sons of Israel to children of Israel to Israelites. And while it's become the, uh, the way of talking about a translation like Israelites as being inclusive, it's not. It's inclusive, but it's also obfuscating. What I do in gender expansive translation is say, the women, children, and Israel of men left Egypt with Moses, right? And so then it reads differently when you're saying, instead of, Joshua smote the Canaanites, 
Joshua slaughtered the women, children, and men of Canaan. You might hear that differently and not gloss over that. Or the crowd was pressing up against Jesus. Well, who's in a crowd? Everybody in the street? The crowd of women, children, and men were pressing up against Jesus. So gender expansive. In addition, I do things like use the matrilineal lineage. So instead of the God of Jacob, it'll be the God of Rebecca's lineage. And in each place where I do that, there'll be brackets and there'll be a note in the text notes under the translation. Um, there are a few other things, but that gives you the sense. Um, I won't talk about uh, the divine name. We'll save that for Q&A so I can move along. I use some neutral and non-binary language for God and humanity, but in this project, I explicitly use feminine language for female characters to put them back on the page, again, where they're in those crowds, but also for God. Because in the church, and to some degree in Judaism, the Psalms are prayed. They can be prayed daily. They can be prayed weekly. They can be prayed several times a day if you do the daily office or you do the daily prayers in Judaism. And so what we all hear is masculine pronouns for God, masculine pronouns for human beings from time past, or collectives that are not easily gendered like Israelite. But what we as humanity, we as people who read and pray the Psalms and the scriptures have not had the experience of hearing is having the, the psalmist be experienced as, as a woman. And there's no reason uh, culturally for the psalm not to be, blessed is the woman who does not sit with sinners or in the seat of the scornful. Uh, because we teach those psalms as though this is how we all, regardless of our gender configurations or performance, this is for how we all are to behave. So I use uh, female gender for the generic person in the psalm. Uh, I also use feminine language for God and talk about that more in the work. So let me give you a medium-sized quote from the translation discourse. As a women's lectionary, this project specifically and intentionally makes women visible in these lectionary texts. This will inevitably seem strange to some hearers and readers. Some will find it welcome and a signifier of inclusion. Some will find it discordant, and I invite those to think deeply about what that discomfiture signifies. These responses may well be amplified when reading and hearing the Psalms using feminine pronouns, and some will find the language in these volumes insufficiently inclusive. This language, my language, like all language, is simply inadequate to express the fullness of God in and beyond the world or even in human creation. The lectionary is a biblical literacy project. It's my hope that our preaching will become richer and more varied and more inclusive and that people will be drawn more deeply into the study of the text and ultimately deeper into relationship with the God who can be found in and through the text. The lectionary is also a theological project asking if the claims we make about God with reference to male characters are true for female characters. Let me back up and say something else about expansive language here. If we move from language like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, it means that we will have not had as church, as Christians and Jews who read and study, I realize that language is not, doesn't work for Jews, but just go with me on this, that we will, have, we will have moved from identifying men with God to identifying a non-gendered humanity with God, and women will not have had the catechetical experience of having their I am created fully in the image of God and called to live imago Dei in the image of God, not have that rarefied for them, reified for them in the language of their liturgy and their hymns and their scripture. And so that's why it's so important for this project. Now, that's a challenge because we're in a post-binary world, right? And so I am 
using binary language kind of on the way to where uh, perhaps the next project, will, it won't be my project, but you know, those who follow in my steps, absolutely, the, the language is gonna to need to be changed as soon as it's published. And, and indeed, each successive volume, I've had more non-binary language as I uh, stay in conversation with groups of readers and consultants. Um, I have a queer and non-binary group uh, to whom I'm accountable. Right, so the language is shifting as I figure out how to do it better, right? So, theological issues. Is it true for female characters what is true for male characters? So I'm gonna to start to say something and y'all are gonna finish this. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do you do that with female characters? God is the God of? Okay, start, start, start over. You got a good loud voice, start over. Guess. Stop. First. Nope. Hagar. Now keep going. Thank you, Keturah, excellent. I mix up Rebecca and Rachel all the time, so you're good with me. <laughs> Keep going. So you're missing a quarter of the tribes because the enslaved matriarchs, Bilhah and Zilpah. Thank you, awesome. Most people do not get Keturah. So awesome, yes. Love them up, love them up. Is God then the God of Hagar, Sarah, Keturah, Rachel, Leah, uh, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Bilhat, and Zilpah? Would these women who were enslaved and forced through surrogacy to give birth to the patriarchs, would they say that that's their God? Would Rachel, who stole the household gods, sat on them, lied about menstruating because she was gonna take those gods with her to her new home no matter what, lied to her daddy in his face? That strongly suggests that whatever God her, hus her new husband was worshiping, that that was not her plan. Her plan was to continue worshiping the gods of her household that she went so far as to steal, right? So we might have to say some different kinds of things and ask, are these things true? And if they're not true for everybody, are they really true? I wanna move and talk a little bit about translation. A phrase that I coined with regard to my work is translation matters. Right? Translation matters and there's always at the back of some biblical scholarly materials. Here's some translator matters, and which is basically the most boring footnotes that e don't even get put in the rest with the rest of the footnotes. They just get put like where the scholars know to find them, right? So on your handouts, you have uh, an exercise uh, called the invisibility of translation. Would someone bring me mine, please? So maybe it's a separate, smaller packet, right? Maybe you have two packets and that's the second small one. Is that correct? It's all in one packet. It's all in one packet. Yeah, but it starts with that one. Okay, so on one side of the back, figure, one side is front, one side is back, figure, figure it out. So there's this passage in Psalms and the reason it's 11 slash 12 is because the numbering of all of the biblical texts is erratic. We'll just leave it that way. And you have now two broad traditions, uh, Bibles that follow the Hebrew numbering and Bibles that don't. <laughs> he scribbled on his, so he wants me to have a clean one. Oh, it's good. Okay. Scribbling is good. 
So I went through in roughly chronological order these texts, including Old English. I really like the, the Old English ones. Um, the NETS there, the NETS, is a translation of the Greek, uh, the Hebrew Bible in Greek. So while that's a modern translation, that Greek text is itself old. So if you look, look at Wycliffe, um, God's going to give a word, that's what that is, to him that preaches the gospel with much virtue. That's nice. The Geneva Bible says, well, God gave the matter to women and they were a great army. Well, something significantly happened between those two translations. And they are in fact reading the same Hebrew text. Uh, great was the company of preachers in the Bishop's Bible that made it into Handel's Messiah. Um, one of our faculty members at Duke, Chad, uh, Dick Lisher, a homiletician, published a book called The Company of Preachers. I looked at it, it's mostly men, a few women, and I said, Dick, why are there men in this book? He said, her? He said, uh, well, the company of preachers. I'm like, it, there's no men in that. That's a feminine plural. Uh, you know, if we were to go all Old English, um, uh, the Holy One gives the word, the preaching women, the preacheresses, are a great army. And just like uh, songstress or seamstress, even with the ways in which we've deliciously complicated gender, when we use that ending, we mean people that identify as female exclusively. So if I say, I was at the Academy Award and the actresses had on wonderful dresses, what I mean by actresses are people who identify as women, right? Uh, some folk who are not actresses, like Billy Porter, are gonna also have on some wonderful dresses. But if I say actresses, I mean people who are identifying and living as women. So when this text says, the preaching women, the women who preach, the women who bring the good news, Hamasa Bakoth, it can't, there just can't really be any dudes in that. But if you look, you would never know that this was a group of preaching women based on the way that all of these dudes translate this. Now, can you think of any reason why some male translators who always work on behalf of churches might not make it clear that they're preaching women in the Hebrew Bible? I mean, it's not like some folk have been fighting about that for millennia, right? So how did I get here? So when you get a list of this, and some of these are Bibles that you're gonna use here in your university studies. Some of these are Bibles you may have at home. One of these might be a Bible that you got at confirmation that you got from your grandmama. Uh, all of these are respectable translations depending on their period of time. So which is correct? Obviously, mine is correct, but, <laughs> but when you're encountering diverse translations, which is correct? That's a question I often get among my students, but I push them to ask a different set of questions. Correct according to whose standards? Who translated the Bibles you read? What are their translation practices? When are they literal? When are they not literal? How do they treat groups of people with regard to gender? What decisions are they making about the words that, let's face it, people who read in English often treat the translation like the primary text? I think Islam is much more useful in saying, all of these are translations, they are only trustworthy to a certain degree. The thing that's trustworthy is the text in the ancestral language. It's a, it's a useful principle. There's some complications with it, but broadly. So who, who translated your Bibles? Is it a committee still arguing over whether one can be black and beautiful in the Song of Songs? Because see, I grew up with a translation that said black but beautiful, beautiful in spite of being black, because we all know black and beautiful don't go together. So even though the conjunction, vav, 
means one thing and one thing only most of the time. Well, that was just anticlimactic. Um, <laughs> and you got to work real hard. You gonna? I thought you were gonna come and help me. <laughs> um, it gets somehow it becomes but here. Well, I pushed that one. Oh well, that's nice. <laughs> So this, some of you remember this, come on. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Okay, now every, some people are telling their age. So the, some of the rest of you are just horrified. All right. So according to virtually all English translations, until the year of Our Lady and non-binary celestial beings, 1989, it was still black, but beautiful. I knew that was wrong when I was a little girl. Oh God, I, I, my memory is like this one down here. All right, all right. I knew that was wrong when I was a little girl, but I couldn't have told you why, because I was a black girl and my parents raised me to know I was beautiful. So this exercise that you saw on Psalm 68, it matters if you're a preaching woman. But if you are a black person, and particularly a black woman, it might be useful to see how translators have struggled with this text, but refusing to relinquish that central notion that there's got to be a but in there because those ideas don't go together naturally. In a longer uh, version of this talk, we look at We look at, I just lost my train of thought. It'll come back to me. Oh, that's really annoying. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and go to, to this piece and then I'm just gonna interrupt when it comes back to me. So, oh, I, oh, it just came back to me. It's, this is how it works. We talk about the fact that some of the verses say that the woman has gone outside and uh, has gotten a sunburn, which an astonishing number of people have argued that meant she couldn't be black because apparently their knowledge of medical sciences means that black people do not also get sunburned. Like this is the, the level at which translation fails because humanity fails because of its built-in biases. And some of these things are in the, the biblical text you read. So one of the things the text says about the woman is that she's black as a Kadari goat, um, black as Solomon's uh, curtains, his goat hair curtains that come from Kadari goats that are black, really black. I wish I could find a Kadari goat with a lovelier face and smile. I mean, there's some adorable goats on the internet. Uh, not these guys. Maybe because of what they're used for. All right, I promise I pushed this down one. So, uh, Nyam Gottwick uh, is one of my favorite models. And when I think about the translation that um, Rabbi Marsha Falk did, which is the one that got me that made me hunt down what a Kadari goat looks like, for me, Nayim Gottwick is the woman behind the song. What it means to be black and beautiful and black as a Kadari goat, right? Not that hard to figure out. So, I have given you an excerpt of the lectionary and so when you open from 
where the invisible translation handout is. This is the Feast of Mary Magdalene. And so the texts I wove together was the text with Hagar naming God. Hagar is the only person of any gender in the scriptures to give God their own name, to name God. And naming things in the ancient Afro-Asiatic world is really an act of power over. Um, and so Hagar names God, and in this naming, uh, they come into this very special relationship. So I wanted to start there. And then the psalm that we talked about with uh, the women preachers. And then this passage in Romans where Paul, who later writers will say is not about women in ministry, is working with an awful lot of men, women in ministry, calling their names, thanking them, and acknowledging them. What's going on with Paul later in his life? I don't know. And then, of course, a Mary Magdalene text. So this is an example of a, a lectionary cycle uh, of readings. And then, somewhere, um, there are the preaching prompts that I leave for uh, pastors to help them think through. Uh, it might be that I didn't copy the, the really technical text notes here. And then a, a page of sort of blurbs about the translation more fully. I'll say before we stop for Q&A that as I thought about the raft of language choices involved in translating scripture, I wanted to do a couple of things um, beyond the gender issues. One is I wanted to get rid of the language Lord, um, which I know is prized in the church, but here's why. Lord is slave-holding language. Uh, both Adonai and Kurios are what enslaved persons call their masters. That's not good language for God, for me. It's also, in the case of the Hebrew Bible, not God's name. Lord is the thing we say because human beings uh, do not have the requisite holiness to pronounce God's name, which exists in the form of four sacred letters, who, when joined together, make a word we don't actually know how to say. There's some scholarly speculation that unfortunately makes its way into textbooks, but that tends to come from Gentile folk who don't have respect for Jewish tradition, and it's really um, kind of an abomination to even try to say that. So Lord is a thing we say because we can't say God's name, and the rabbis left us a series of footnotes of here are some other words to say. Adonai Lord is only one that appears in the Bible. All right, so. Uh, I limit father to conversations about Jesus' paternity, um, sonship language, for some of you know that. Uh, with kingdom, okay, what's a kingdom? It's an aspirational empire, right? Men with power imagine that God was a bigger man with power. And that's the language we have for God. But what did kingdoms do in the ancient world? Tax the peasants? went to war with their neighbors, like God is really not doing this, right? Kingdom is bureaucracy language. What our ancestors were perhaps trying to get at was the majesty and magnificence of God. So I talk, and in my translation, uh, little children, I long to give you the majesty of God, the majesty of heaven, right? Being in God's space, being with and around God not like in a Disney world where you're a princess and you're a duke and you're a duchess. It's not that. So that language I have thrown on the other side. The issues of Judeans and Jews. Rabbi Danya Rutberg, um, who is a Twitter friend of mine, says, 
nothing good happens to the Jews when you hear the expression, the Jews, right? That's kind of up there with the blacks, right? So sometimes the gospel uses that language and sometimes it means the people who live in Judea. Sometimes it means the people who practice the ancestral religion of Judea, Judaism. Sometimes it means the people from Judea who are followers of the Jesus movement, so they are Jewish Christians. It uses the same word in all of those situations and scholars have argued about it for a while. So I use Judeans normatively, except when it's a religious context, because then I wanna make clear that um, a tradition or practice of Judaism, such as uh, when Jesus' body was wrapped according to Jewish tradition, right? So if it's a religious or cultural practice, I will of course use Jewish. Now, what, what, what might seem at odds with what I do with gender is I keep the slave language in the Bible. I actually put it back in so that we in the Atlantic Basin will wrestle with how much the language of slavery is normative in the scriptures, how much human beings are called God, how much human beings abase themselves as the slave of God. Here am I, Mary the female slave of God who she addresses with a title of enslavement, master slave language. That's language we have to wrestle with because it was because of this language in the scriptures and ravenous white supremacist greed that we, our first form of government in this country was Slovocracy and not democracy. So I will stop there and have you ask questions and perhaps we'll have some good conversation. Thank you. I saw that movie, Aliens. So I do use God. In the back of the lectionary, there is a list of all the names that I use for the divine. Uh, and I got started on that with Rabbi Joel, Dr. Joel uh, Rosenberg, who translated the Psalms for the Reconstructionist Siddur, the prayer book of the recon now reconstructing movement of Judaism. And he used uh, expressions like fount of life, source of life, the eternal, and those just really captured me in prayer. So that's the language that I use, uh, drawing on my African-American Christianity, like the ark of safety is one of my favorites, the fire of Sinai, God who thunders, she who is majesty. Um, and when it's go slaughter the Midianites, uh, it's the dread God, leaning into Rastafari, um, the inscrutable God. Uh, so I have all of, uh, but that language, that replaces the, replaces the tetragrammaton. Um, uh, the Lord of hosts is another one. Like if you're really churchy, you kind of get it, but for most people, a host it gives you a good time at a party and is not so much ripping your guts out and wearing them as a necklace, right? So host is a military unit, like a battalion, right? So uh, the sovereign commander of heaven's armies or uh, the commander of winged warriors or the commander of the vanguard of heaven, uh, that kind of language there. And then uh, with, uh, in the New Testament, there's, mm, um, you know, the, 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 lilies don't, uh, the lilies don't have to worry about the food, I just lost that verse, the sparrows don't have to worry, but your heavenly provider knows what you need. There is no reason to put father in there. 
um, uh, there's a place where there's weaver of the world. So there's lots of diverse God language, but I do use God for, for Elohim and El and Eloah when they come up. Uh, uh, behind and then in front. Uh. <laughs> hello, hello. in a social, yes, sociologically. So I am a, ask, I don't even necessarily ask forgiveness later, um, although that's something I'm working on. I, I have a confessor now, uh, so the world is a better place for it. But I, I just kind of do what I want to do in terms of religiously, when my friend said, you know, Dr. Gaffney, do this, do this, my spiritual path involves God leading me in ways that are not always clear. There are some things I knew. For example, I knew that I was called to teach scripture. So when I was then called to preach, I told God, no, I was called to teach scripture, at which point I got plucked in the side of the head, they go together. Fine. So then when I was called to be a pastor, I'm like, oh, this is how we're doing this? Every couple of years, you're just going to drop a new one? Fine, I'll do that too. Oh, or did you say army chaplain? Whatever, I'm going. Right, so things just unroll. So when the church calls us through people, right, it may be a committee um, that calls you into ministry. It may be a loose group of people saying, like, we got to pray about this. Okay, then let's pray about it and let's work about it. Like the church, the church calls you in different kind of ways. And so I experienced that as a call. I was like, well, let me see what I can do. I was first ordained in the AME Zion Church, a deacon and elders orders there. And because of some stuff in the Episcopal Church, I was ordained again, deacon and priest. Is that archbishop or cardinal with four ordinations? I'm not quite sure. So. In the AME Zion Church, that, for me, my first ordination was pivotal, crossing a threshold, and my dear God, last and final ordination, the Episcopal Church, was also very meaningful. But in the AME Zion Church, there was a line that the bishop said, take thou authority to read the scriptures and preach the same. And as I sat with this project, I said, that's, that's what I'm doing. The church, not Bishop J. Clinton Hogarth, the church, including some of y'all that don't ordain women, the church ordained me and messed around and told me to take authority that they had conferred upon me. So in a conversation with some largely uh, Catholic folk, they said, you can't just write a lectionary. So it never occurred to me that I couldn't, and I did. But that's not how the church decides on lectionaries. I said, that's true. I wrote it to be published. Um, now, it's being used on four continents in six countries. Um, in the Episcopal Church, it's kind of a guerrilla lectionary. Some bishops have looked at it and written pastoral letters authorizing it. No bishop has written against it. Um, some priests have used it with their bishop's permission. A whole bunch of priests have used it without their bishop's per permission. Um, I have both Lutheran and Episcopal bishops that fly me out to train them and their, and their folk. So it wasn't so much an obstacle, but uh, it was surprise. And when I pitched it to the Episcopal press, and n again, it was in, it's in no process for consideration to be a regular liturgy of the church, it's just kind of another reference book on the desk. Um, the press said, okay. And I said, good, maybe that'll make it look a little more 
official or in conversation dialogue with the church. And so I was, I was blown away by how much it has been adopted. And the stories that come back to me, woman wrote me to tell me she reads it to her daughter while she's nursing her. Um, a seminary friend, her nephew's locked up. He's using it on the inside, working with men, because he prayed that God would send him resources to work with men who need to know more about women in the Bible. And I'm like, that's not the only preacher that God called to teach more women in the Bible, but he's the only one I know who listens so dramatically. When I told that story, a woman reached out to me on Facebook and said, oh, I'm a chaplain at LA, at LA County Jail. We use it there. And then at the Society of Biblical Literature, a young man came up to me and said he was a chaplain at Rikers and they were using it there. Like, I had no vision that this was prison ministry, right? So I know this is slightly off of your topic, but I didn't experience any row bumps, except for the time I had to translate 151 verses of Greek at a time, because that Good Friday reading is long. Um, and the Monday Thursday one is another 150, and we are not using any of, any of John. We're just not using any of the John language that not just sounds anti-Semitic, but is anti-Semitic. We're not doing his blood be on us and our children. We're not doing you know, the Jews kill Christ language. We just, we have other gospels. We don't have to continue that because we are responsible for the violence that those texts have caused. So honestly, there were no obstacles. I think it probably helped that I was more than tenured a full professor and endowed chair. Um, and as the children say, who gonna check me, boo, right? So. Thank you for that question. And now, you in front. Maybe. So there's a woman, I believe she's a Roman Catholic sister named Anne Patrick Ware. I, know, I don't know if she's still living. She took the Mithean genealogy of Jesus and she went back and pulled all the women and she made it a genealogy from woman to woman. From like from Eve to Bathsheba uh, 40 generations. From Bathsheba to Mary another 40 generations. And so I use that rather than the passage from Matthew. So that is slightly extra canonical. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, like uh, Gnostic gospels or, or things like that, uh, I don't do that. Now, as an Episcopalian, the deuterocanonical texts are canonical scripture for me. So there are places where I'm using Judith and Susanna and Tobit and passages that will not be canonical to Protestants. So one year I did that for uh, the four weeks of Advent, but then I gave a uh, Hebrew Bible passage for all those Protestants that wouldn't know what to do with that. But in other places, I just leave it as the first lesson. So I think I'm already doing enough. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll do it enough. And of course, there will be those who say I did too much, but you know, thank you. Sure, I'm not driving home tonight. And the gentleman in the back as well. Did we miss anybody over this kind of last call? One and two. All right. I'm sorry, it's very fuzzy. Oh, yes, I do, because everybody was in my box. I, I wrote on that publicly. Yes, so there is a second volume of Womanist Midrash that is at the publishing house, which covers the early prophets or former prophets, which are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings as books. Uh, because the Hebrew Bible is organized differently than the Old Testament, and my writing always follows the Hebrew Bible. Now, 
Since I'm doing judges, I'm doing these uh, grotesquely violent, uh, we call them pornotropic texts uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And what I do with Jephthah's daughter, oh, I should say that, if you remind me, Chad, I'm gonna give you the link. At the Proctor Conference, which is the premier academic conference for black clergy lay scholars that we just finished, Dean Nichelle Guidry of Sisters Chapel at Spelman University preached on that passage, tore the house down. If you see the video, I'm, you know, I'm just mobbing her at the pulpit. Like we, this is the thing in black, when you're preaching good, black preachers don't stay in their seats. We'll just be up in your face. You're trying to preach and we'll just be banging on the table in front of you. Yeah, we, yeah, breaking stuff. So. She preached that so well, I'm gonna give it to Chad uh, so that you all can hear that. But what I did with it is I started with Jephthah. There is no excuse for a man who murders his child and calls it religion. But there are some things to understand about his formation. Like Gideon is running around with sex workers, fathers this child, whether he knows it or not, at some point, he becomes aware. He uproots the child from the mother, brings the child to his home where the child is battered by his sons, neglected by his wife, and put up. So Jephthah is not equipped to parent well. It's not an excuse, but it's a thing we need to know about people because we can't throw everybody away. So I start with this, but I also start with, God ain't asked for that, it's completely unnecessary, he's insecure, he makes this vow, like, like the, one of my students does this translation, Chad, the comer out that comes out. Because as soon as you translate it, this rel relative particle, it can be who, what, that, or which. As soon as you say who comes out or what comes out, you as a translator has already shifted it to, if it's who comes out, it's his daughter. If it's what comes out, it's, there were no chickens, it's a cow, right? But if you keep it ambiguous, the comer out that comes out of the door first is what I will, is, I will sacrifice the comer out that comes out first. That's how she does it. Well, he had already won the war against the Amorites. So it's not, God, I'm desperate. In order to, to you know, be successful in this war, I'm gonna need some extra juice, right? It wasn't even, he'd already, won. there's just no reason. So we talk about all of that. And then, as so I do all the, the stuff, talk about, you know, Isaac got saved other people get saved, there's no salvation for her. But I take seriously what it says, that he's gonna offer her up as, you know, as a, an olah, a burnt offering. And there's a way to do that. And so I go back to Leviticus, which tells us how to do that, and then I rewrite it using him and her. This is, this is gonna be difficult language, that if he does what Leviticus says, he hangs her up by her heels, he decapitates her and drains her blood. He cuts open her belly and pulls out her organs. He peels her skin off her. All right, so I just like, this is what it says, how to do it, so like, I do that. So, I mean, it's bad to say that he said he was gonna kill her and offer her up. Like, like let's, let's take seriously what this text is saying. And then I ask, okay, if I were in my church, I would swear, where the heck are the neighbors? Like, nobody is smelling this? You cannot burn a whole human being and nobody knows. So, so I go at it that way. Um, Dr. Guidry, Dean Guidry, talked about the use of religion as a cover and excuse to violate and harm daughters. I mean, just that simple. Some dude came up like, we're not safe in your religion. That's something that she said. Like, um, so that sermon was very powerful. But the larger event was that uh, a, group, a, a group of people got this text 
as a translation exam for ordination, which is a very fraught and emotional time with sort of no, no warning, no care for people who might be survivors of physical or sexual violence. Uh, and not, not that text, they got the text about the Levite secondary wife and the gang rape and slaughter and all of that. And so uh, that's what that's in regard to. All right, let's, let's do move on. It's, it's, the sound yes. is fuzzy, and I'm, I can hear you volume, but I'm not hearing you clearly. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, is this better? Okay, so you quoted Psalm 1, uh, which says in the ESV, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, which I understand is a bad translation because it uses man, um, whereas the original would best be translated as person for ish, the Hebrew word ish. Um, but you said you translate that as woman instead, isha. That's a totally different word. Why do you do that? Because the type of translation I'm using for this project, gender expansive, includes producing a version of the Psalter that uses female persons for human persons and for the divine. I'm not making an argument that uh, whether it's ish or even when there's a, a masculine participle that the word ish means isha or that isha means ish. I'm saying that in terms of generic humans, rather than going with man, and sometimes uh, uh, on this side of the text, uh, we can make an argument that ish is being used generically for person, but sometimes it just means man, uh, and it's not being thought of inclusively or representatively at all, right? Um, so I am not translating ish with woman. I'm actually making a substitution because I'm doing a different project with the Psalter, which I lay out in the introductory material. Okay? Certainly. Hebrew from Divinity School. So do you have a suggestion on a gender expansive translation uh, for those of us who are preaching in parishes every yeah. day? So the four volumes of the lectionary do that for that reason. I mean, that's, that's what the project is. Um, and if you're uh, preaching the RCL, you know, I have a lot of folk that use the women's lectionary as their commentary to support that preaching. In terms of the Bibles that I assign in my, in my classroom, you know, the NRSV is useful, but it has problems. The JPS is useful, but it has problems. The CVS is really useful, and then it has really big problems. Um, but what I, what I like for people who really want a different set of language like in an entirely published Bible rather than units is the inclusive Bible. Um, I think in terms of its project at being inclusive and because of its notes, which also tell you what it's doing, what it's trying to do, that it does as well as it can with Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic and in keeping with this project of being inclusive. I mean, there's always some trade-off on one towards the other, but I think it's a useful work. All right. Is that the last one? Was there one more? Okay. <laughs> 